valves to uh, uh, boiler operators to many, many, many skills. Uh, we spent every we do three outages, and and generally those three outages have a, a price tag of five million dollars per year. It is not simple to do. Uh, it is a machine, and we're maintaining the machine as day one. So it's not cheap, but at the same time. Uh, it's utilizing monies in our own community. It's very sustainable. Again, you, you balance things. Uh, less environmental and greenhouse impacts. Uh, we have, we get a lot of waste from Seattle. Uh, for items, whether they be foam from old refrigerators that have Freon in it, we destroy that. Uh, whether it is um, impacts from the port, uh, the USDA inspects loads, uh, if they do not pass muster, instead of sending it back to China, they send it to us and we destroy it. Uh, you're looking at a, at a situation where uh, landfills are stored for future generations to manage. You're just putting it in the ground, entombing it, and leaving it for future generations to deal with. And the problem with that is it, it will happen, it's just a matter of time. Uh, we are an energy generator versus an energy user. Uh, it actually increased our recycling percentage. When I started, we were recycling about 10%. Now we're in 43% range. Uh, it, it, you know, you hear the argument, well, you've got a size capacity, you've got to feed it. We all have enough garbage. I mean, that is not the problem. <laughs> and, and it doesn't make sense because in a recycling arena, in the business area, you've got somebody that will pay you for recycling. It has value. Uh, you're going to have to pay me to get rid of it. There's a huge chasm of economics between the two. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't work. Uh, and, and if you properly size these facilities, which we have done, uh, probably conservatively a little bit more, uh, it, it, does, it in fact increases. Why? You know, all you talk, all the recyclers, well, we're not getting paid enough for our paper. We're not getting paid enough for our metal. Well, or plastics. Why not? If that recycler had a different option to do something with, maybe convert it to energy, well, well, we have to compete now. Now they pay more for the recycle. So it actually increased the, the economic value of that recycled product. Uh, and that's real. Uh, obviously, less travel impacts. Uh, we currently still have to ship garbage out, and man, it costs money. Uh, uh, I already mentioned does not compete with recycling. Uh, does Another misconception is that, well, it's going to take gas. you got to maintain the fire or oil or something else. These plants uh, utilize gas, but only on startup and shutdown to maintain the proper combustion. Other than that, they're self-sustaining fire. Uh, they are a net generator of energy, but does not need any supplement. Uh, they are not incinerators of the past. The reason why they're called waste energy plants because incinerators themselves use supplemental energy, gas or oil, to, to sustain a combustion. There was no heat recovery. There was no air cleaning equipment. There was no <coughs> control systems. Those were incinerators of the past. This is much, much more cleaner, efficient. Uh, when we were analyzing for a plant, you have to do an environmental impact statement. We did five human health environmental risk assessments. What came out was the it wasn't the air quality from the plant, it was the air quality from the trucks and the traffic coming. That, I mean, it's so small from the plant that, you know, the, the modeling, we did very, very sophisticated modeling. We actually had a university build the plant and, and the surrounding topography and ran the whole, even in worst case scenarios. And it panned out not a problem, not an issue. Yeah. It, it, technology isn't the issue. Uh, 
we generate a net output of 500 to 600 kilowatt hours per ton. Output. This is net of use. So gives you an idea. Wow, you know, this is clean renewable energy. This is what our facility looks like. It's right alongside Interstate 90, exit 276. Uh, we have had over 55,000 people visit the plant. It is a tourist attraction <laughs> from 14 different countries. From, uh, many people here have visited the plant. It is uh, uh, a little bigger scale. It's owned by the city of Spokane. Uh, it was um, operated by a private company, Woolabrator Spokane Inc., which is a company now owned by Waste Management. So Waste Management has the flexibility to do many things, um, uh, including landfill, but also with energy, with, with its branch of Woolabrator. Woolabrator was its highest earning sector in Waste Management. So, again, through these economic times, Waste Management survived by Woolabrator. Uh, we serve approximately 450,000. Uh, we actually, 50% of the whole system was financed by state referendum 26 and 39 monies, the clean water uh, grants. So that enabled us to do this. And we cleaned up our landfills. Startup is September 6th. So we have been operational for 20 years. Construction costs, 110 million dollars. Uh, that was in 1989 money. Uh, so right now the site size is 32 acres. It used to be 40, 47. Uh, but we have given part of our land to a new materials recovery facility that is being propelled by Works Management. A 20 million dollar facility, a state of the art materials recovery facility. Uh, that is, uh, should be under construction here in the next month operational next fall. Uh, it, it took me uh, from day one to actual facility running 10 years. Of that time, only took only 22 months to construct, design and control. <laughs> so engineering is not the problem. Uh, uh, we have a guaranteed capacitor, 248,200 tons. We have a full contract, 20-year contract with Willibrator. They design, they construct, and they operate for 20 years with the city of Spokane owning it. Now, to do this is not easy, a contractual nightmare. But we actually went back and changed the law so that we, and, and that's available for you as well, that you don't have to take low bid. You can take the best bid. Uh, ours happened to be the low, but, and there was heavy competition. We had over 20 firms interested in bidding in our facility from all over the world. Uh, so it, it is a very real situation. We have an escalating contract with Puget Sound Energy. We actually wheel the power through a VISTA, through BPA, and deliver it on a daily basis to Puget Sound Energy. We're a mass burn facility. Uh, we, city of Spokane is very, as I mentioned, conservative. We look at proven technology that will run the plant is over 90% 90 90 available every second of the year. And that's including outages. So you, we have three outages uh, a year in order to maintain the facility. Uh, we structure that outage and we plan for that outage uh, at least a month before the outage. We have vulnerable reciprocating grades, which are made from Switzerland. Uh, we have U.S. boilers. Babcock and Wilcox water wall boilers. It operates 24 hours a day, seven days per week. Uh, we burn at approximately 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, no supplemental fuels. We have a 90% reduction in volume, which is what you're concerned about with waste, uh, and 70% reduction by weight. We have state-of-the-art controls. Uh, we built this knowing what's coming in the future. So. Primarily, this is state of the art. This acid gas scrubbers. Uh, we have Vortec bag houses, again, probably three times more expensive than a regular bag house. Uh, we have thermal denox to man manage the NOx. We have powdered activated carbon injection that was added. Uh, even though we didn't need it, it was new technology, uh, proven technology. Uh, and we have continuous emission monitoring.